First up, we've got uh, Dr. Claire LaFal, who's Associate Professor of East European Jewish History and Culture at the University of Southampton, and who is running the Parks Institute. Um, Russian Socialists and the Jewish Question, and she will be followed by Dr. Charlotte Lydia Riley, a lecturer in 20th century British history, also at the University of Southampton. And she'll be speaking on anti-Semitism and the British left from the late 19th century to the 1980s. So we've got two talks today that are about history. Okay, so thank you very much, everyone. And at that point, uh, we will begin our talk. And that will also be followed, as we say, by discussion, questions and chat. Hello, everyone. Thank you, George. So in this um, presentation, I would like to outline the specificities of red anti-Semitism in Russia and the Soviet Union to offer, uh, to offer a comparative framework for our discussion and remind ourselves that the question of anti-Semitism on the left is neither new nor specific to Britain. The question is not new but has been ignored for uh, a while in the case of Russia. However, red anti-Semitism has become a subject of interest recently and has produced a stimulating publication that I will use in, in this paper, uh, including Brandon McGiver's book, uh, Andrew Slaw and Petrovsky Stern as well. It's probably not necessary to remind the audience that uh, Jews represented a large part of the population in the cities and towns uh, of the Russian Empire, particularly in the Western territories where they were confined, uh, and the, the regions that now are Ukraine, Belarus, and the Baltic states. The first wave of pogroms in uh, 1881, as well as uh, the growing Judeophobia in the Russian Empire and other socioeconomic factors, resulted in the politicization and radicalization of the Jewish population at the end of the 19th century and many Jews uh, joined newly created uh, political parties, Jewish political parties, but some of them also joined the Russian Social Democratic Party. And I will try to explain why, in spite or because of the, the important role played by the Jews in the birth and in the development of Russian social democracy, and in spite of the internationalist idea of the Russian social democrats, anti-Semitism was present in Russian socialism from the beginning. As anecdotal as it might seem, the efforts invested by the Soviet state to hide Lenin's remote Jewish roots are very telling. Although tolerating Jews and seeking their support, the Bolsheviks did not want to be directly associated with them and did not want the Jewish question to interfere with their political agenda. This red anti-Semitism originated in two different strands of Judeophobia. One linked to the Jews' traditional social economic role, the other resulting from diverging political strategies. And these two strands ultimately converged in a new form of racial anti-Semitism that I will uh, explain. Let's turn first to the socioeconomic factor. Since the emergence of socialism in Russia in the half of the 19th century, socialists had an ambivalent attitude towards Jews and anti-Semitism. A small number of populists welcomed the pogroms of 1881 that followed uh, the assassination of the Tsar Alexander II, because they saw these assaults as a long-awaited reaction of the exploited class, the peasantry, against its exploiters, the Jews. While this analysis was uh, wrong factually and did not take into account actually the fact that these attacks took place mostly in cities and towns and not in the, the countryside, it also shows that long-standing stereotypes about the Jewish exploitation of the peasantry were well rooted in the Russian population. These stereotypes were popular not only among the Tsarist officialdom and police, but also more widely in the intelligentsia and uh, in this emerging political position. For some socialists, attacks against Jews uh, were seen as a necessary evil in the path to the mass, the masses politicization and to the revolution. 
The ethnic, social, and economic tensions between the Russian proletariat and the Jews were therefore often downplayed by socialists who closed a blind eye on workers' violence against Jews, uh, for example, during the, the, the second wave of pogroms, 1903-1906. These tensions, born from economic competition, only deteriorated <clears throat> under the Soviet rule. And I will come back to this. The second factor in this left-wing antisemitism is connected to political and strategical tensions. The, interior, the internationalism at the root of Marxist ideology was applied by Lenin and some other theoreticians of Russian Marxism in an ambivalent way towards the Jews, or some would say in a pragmatic way. On the one hand, Russian SDs and Lenin in particular welcomed the support of Jews of the Jewish Labour uh, Bund, of the Jewish Labour Party, and supported an alliance of OSD groups in the empire without differentiation between ethnic groups, especially at crucial moments such as the revolution of 1905 or the civil war. From the beginning, Russian social democracy condemned anti-Semitism and equated it with Tsarist reaction, counter-revolution, and state oppression of minorities under the Tsars. It was well articulated by Plekhanov during the Congress of 1903, where he called on his party to combat anti-Semitism and chauvinism, just before the, the, the Kishinev pogrom. So the, the social democrats supported Jewish self-defense during the pogroms of 1903-1906 and developed education and militia activity against programists. But as already mentioned, they also kept silent about workers' participation in pogroms. And some local socialists uh, even called off some demonstrations and protests to avoid anti-Semitic attacks by workers. This ambivalence towards the Jewish question led actually to a split between the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party and the Jewish Bund. Political tensions emerged as soon as Bundists sought to have more autonomy within the SD movement and started to advocate national rights for the Jewish population. And it resulted in a split between the Bund and the ISDRP, so the Russian Social Democratic Party, in 1903. Between 1903 and 1914, uh, Lenin wrote several texts about the Jewish question uh, and this, in this text, it's very obvious that um, a growing political gap was um, uh, increasing between the Bolsheviks and, and the Bundists. However, most historians agree on the fact that Lenin was hostile to the Bund and to Jewish nationalism, not because of a personal animosity towards Jews or any other ethnic minority, but because Jews or Bund, the Bund, posed a threat to the unity of the Bolshevik party, uh, to the revolution, and to the centrality of the Russian language as the state language. Following the Marxist idea of internationalism, Lenin and later Stalin called for the assimilation of the Jewish population. So that was the solution for a socialist to the Jewish question. And although they had to stretch this idea and to adapt this idea to the reality and to the fact that actually Jews uh, uh, were a, a nation and wanted to have national rights and, and um, the Soviet Union actually uh, provided the Jews with the same national rights as other national groups in the Soviet Union, uh, this idea that Jews should eventually assimilate and should stop claiming a separate national idea returned very strongly, in particular during the Great Patriotic War, so the Second World War, and afterwards. It culminated in the denial of the Holocaust after the war as a separate crime and the brutal anti-cosmopolitan campaign that led to the assassination of uh, prominent Yiddish writers in 1952. Thus, it is 
obvious that the Bolsheviks did not want the Jews to have their own separate path and their own separate narrative, in particular of the Great Patriotic War. This refusal of separate national identities was however applied to all ethnic groups without distinction, at least until the Second World War, and one could argue that Jews were not treated differently than other ethnic groups and were not targeted as a distinctive group, uh, in particular during the Great Terror of 1937. Uh, Jewish religious buildings were closed in the 1920s, as were Orthodox, Muslim or Catholic religious buildings. Their communal, communal institutions and political parties were forbidden, as were those of other groups. As with other recognized uh, nationalities, the Jewish culture, the Jewish language, in that case only the Jewish language, not Hebrew, were also supported and promoted by the Soviet state. And Jews, unlike other nationalities, were even the object of a special attention when the party and the Soviet state conducted regular campaigns uh, against anti-Semitism, so during the Civil War, but also at the end of the 1920s. So it can seem that the Jewish question was not a question at all for the Russian socialists and that it did not represent a particular threat, at least until um, 1948 or the, the after-war period. However, there is another layer in this story. In spite of the official discourses against anti-Semitism and the calls for assimilation, anti-Jewish sentiments were still very strong in Soviet Russia. The Soviet economic policies of the 1920s and 1930s only reinforced these uh, anti-Jewish sentiments. Let me look at a few examples. Let's start with the, the new economic policies that were adopted uh, after the Civil War, so at the beginning of the 1920s. And these policies aimed among other things, at the productivization of uh, the artisans and at the normalization of trade by eradicating speculation and illegal trade. And because of their strong presence in these sectors, in these economic sectors, in the republics of Belarus and Ukraine, the Jews were disproportionately affected by these policies. And as a matter of fact, the, this productivization of artisan turned into a productivization of Jews. If this economic policy aimed eventually at their social integration into uh, the Soviet society, it was actually at the price of their abandonment of problematic forms of Jewishness. And these problematic forms of Jewishness were Zionism, their petit bourgeois origins, and the, the Jewish involvement in trade. Stalin's rise to power at the end of the 1920s marked a reversal of these integrationist policies. First, the shift to rapid industrialization disrupted the social and economic structure of society. Uh, workers had to produce more and faster. Uh, they had to uh, produce to meet some norms and quotas, and it created lots of anxieties and dissatisfaction, lots of complaints of workers against about their wages and about the norms. And it often resulted in anti-Semitic acts in uh, factories. Second, Stalin's struggle for power and his obsessive fight against oppositionists on the left, on the right, involving Trotsky, Kamenev, Zinoviev, Bukharin, uh, resulted in the unmasking and hunting of what he called class enemies. And these class enemies were now clearly defined, clearly identified, clearly named. There were Bundists, Trotskyites, National Democrats, National Chauvinists. And because many Jews, especially well, in the republic that I already mentioned, so Belarus in particular, but also Ukraine, uh, 
So because many Jews in these republics opposed the industrialization, they felt victims of these attacks against class enemies and nationalists. And the fight against political deviationists in Belarusia and Ukraine became a way of discussing Jewishness and Jews in a muted fashion. By denouncing deviationists and fighting against class enemies, the Soviet authorities implicitly targeted the Jews in Belarusia as a group that did not and could not integrate as a non-transformable social group, hence racializing the rhetoric against Jews. So in conclusion, the Russian case shows first that we should differentiate between theory and practice when looking at Russian socialist attitude to Jews. Although on paper everything was clear, and anti-Semitism should be combated. In practice, Russian socialists often adapted and distorted the Marxist internationalist principle. And second, in Russia, where Jews were considered and considered themselves a nation, the overlap between class and ethnic identity led to an invisible but deep racialization of the class and national questions. When the Soviet state in the 1920s and 30s attacked, I quote, the unhealthy economic practices of the shtetl or the national democratic deviation, it actually targeted the Jews directly as an ethnic group and raised the question of their unassimilability. The implicit correlation between class enemy, bourgeois, Trotskyite, deviationist and Jews became an assumption for many and created a new form of anti-Semitism. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that. Yep, they're very interesting. Um, so thanks, Claire. Um, maybe we'll go to Charlotte now, and then following that, we can maybe hear from our audience with their various questions. Great. Okay. Can I, can you hear me? Um, yes. Unmuted. Good. Okay, great. So thank you, first of all. Um, thank you, Yuri, for inviting me to speak on this panel. Um, I feel like something of an imposter because I am a historian of the Labour Party. So I'm a historian of the left um, and I work on British identity, including race, but I I don't focus on this history in, in my writing um, and this isn't my specialism. What I'm going to do is talk about two interconnected ideas I do think about a lot in my work, which think provide an interesting conceptual framework through which we can think about the issue of the left and anti-Semitism in Britain. Um, I should also say that um, the title of my talk is wildly ambitious um, and I am not covering that time period at all. So but we can talk a little bit maybe about this longer time period in, in the questions. So the things I wanted to talk about today, the two conceptual issues I wanted to talk about were firstly the way that British identity and British political cultures have been formulated in Britain in the context of imperialism and the way that we need to think about British identity through a kind of prism of empire. And secondly, the way that the British left draws on its own history as part of its contemporary political identity was part of a wider national mythmaking in Britain framed around particular tropes from national history that are popularly understood. And the way that the left in particular kind of builds a political identity drawing on particular moments in history. And the historian Emily Robinson has done quite a lot of work on this, on the way that Labour in particular kind of likes to look at key points in its history and say, this is who we are today. And so firstly, I should also say that there is a way of talking about the British left and anti-Semitism that focuses on the Israel-Palestine question. And I'm not going to do that today, partly because I think it's a less interesting story historically. Um, and also because I don't think it explains actually as much as it elides. There is a long history of both Zionism and anti-Zionism on the British left. And neither of these really explains anti-Semitism in left politics, except insofar as it becomes a space in which either anti-Semitic or Zionist ideas can be explored, or also a way in which kind of debates can kind of, I don't know, become sort of lazy or unthinking anti-Semitism, which then becomes kind of hardened and ideological in these spaces. So I think it's a space which often kind of pushes people into particular modes of discussion, but it doesn't necessarily explain that much about anti-Semitism on the left more broadly. So 
I think there's a story you can tell in British history about the way that anti-Semitism has become the particular way in which anti-Semitism works on the British left and the ways in which left wing anti-Semitism has perhaps been distinct from anti-Semitism on the right in Britain. And I think this is interesting to me as a historian of uh, Britain who thinks quite a lot about the idea way in which sort of racism generally has been embedded in British politics and culture and society and the way that different sorts of racist tropes and ideologies have become associated with different bits of British society. So for example elite racism or structural racism within the British political establishment compared with popular popular in inverted commas racism or street level racist violence for example. And I think two things are important to remember here. Firstly, that the British or the British left or the British working classes are not homogenous groups. Um, and that we need to separate myths about British identity from the realities of British lived experience. So the British values that schools in Britain since 2014 have been mandated to teach to children are democracy, the rule of law, individual liberty, and mutual respect and tolerance of different faiths and beliefs. And Britain is supposedly uniquely disposed to all of these things. This is kind of built into our curriculum at school level. And I think we should be critical of this idea at government level for many reasons. But I think you can be quite supportive of this idea at local level. That is to say that the establishment and the states and the elites have often historically not embodied those values. But ordinary people and communities often have. And so I think we need to think about anti-Semitism as something which can be kind of structural and elite but also how responses to anti-Semitism might be more community based um, or might be things that are work more on a grassroots level. So to take the question of, anti of imperialism first, um, my research focuses on the ways that British history and culture have been fundamentally shaped by empire. I am part of the new imperial history movement, which is actually not new now really, um, as spearheaded by historians like Antoinette Burton and Catherine Hall. And this means that I would always argue that modern Britain can only be understood as part of a metropole. Modern Britain can only be understood as a state at the centre of empire. And that British culture, politics and society have to be read through its role in first building and then losing an empire. And that questions of race, ethnicity, class and gender fit within that context of imperialism and decolonisation. And I think the British left has always had a very much more complicated relationship to empire and race than has often been supposed. Um, there is a general sense often that the politics of the left and the Labour Party in Britain were inherently anti-imperialist. And that's not the case. There is plenty of pro and writing on the left in Britain in the late 19th and 20th centuries. Labour governments had distinct policies to empire, for sure. You know, part of my work is about looking at how Labour looks at empire differently to the Conservatives. But they don't necessarily have anti-imperial policies or policies that we would understand today to be anti-racist. Um, as a side note, the Attlee government is so pro-imperial in the 1940s that they become very aggressively anti-Zionist through their kind of pro-imperialism. So the left in Britain often colluded in empire. The empire is a space that can be imagined as a salvation and a space of opportunity, for example, for white working class communities. Um, the Labour Party in Britain enacted anti-immigration policies, for example, the 1965 White Paper or the 1968 Commonwealth Immigration Act. And trade unions, for example, often refuse to support people of colour in their fight for, for better wages or conditions at work, focusing on the rights of male workers. The, um, the so-called kind of alien panics at the end of the 19th century in Britain are part of the left as well as part of the right. So that kind of that sort of anti-Semitism that's framed around um, working class Jewish people who are perceived as, as coming in um, as part of a working class community is a left wing tradition as much as it is a right wing tradition. And the reason I'm drawing attention to this history of imperialism and racism is because I think it's very important to remember this history in the context, for example, of Jeremy Corbyn claiming that the Labour Party could not be anti-Semitic because it had always been anti-racist. Because the Labour Party and the left in Britain has not always been anti-racist. And that's that, you know, there are many ways to critique that statement. But that is actually, I think, one of the more, one of the important ways in which to critique that statement, that there is no kind of there's no way in which we can read labor as being fundamentally opposed to prejudice actually even when we look at anti-imperialism on the left in terms of the question of anti-semitism this also becomes problematic there has often been a very simplistic reading of anti-imperialism on the british left about their own history and this often feeds into anti-semitism in the left in britain <clears throat> 
And this has happened through the embracing of tropes, both at the time and as historical tropes, as empire as being controlled by uh, sort of Jewish financiers and imperialism as something which is largely pushed and supported by quote unquote bankers, which is coded often to mean Jewish bankers. And this can be seen from the beginning of Labour's critique of imperial policies um, and perhaps, you know, most infamous again, the kind of recent political events in J.A. Hobson's 1902 book, Imperialism. So in this text, which became a very important, you know, I, I think it needs to be kind of underlined. This is a really important text in terms of anti-imperial critique on the left in Britain, and it is sustained as an important text throughout the 20th century. It's something thinkers go back to a lot. But in this book, Hobson rails against imperialism as exploitative of the British working classes, who he sees as having been sent to fight and die in the Boer War only because the upper classes profit from imperialism. Hobson objects to working class young men being sent to die thousands of miles from home to protect the bank balances of their aristocratic rulers. And this is a standard left wing critique of imperialism. And this is taken up by many other writers to argue for an international solidarity between working classes across national and imperial boundaries. But Hobson goes much further than this in building a political case to link capitalism and imperialism. And he does this through developing an anti-Semitic theory of transnational capitalist imperialism. So he argues that the war and in fact all imperial wars are financed, financed by, quote, men of a single and peculiar race. He argues that no war would be possible without the House of Rothschild behind it. Um, and if you go to his writing around the time sort of beyond the book, um, there's, there's kind of more support for this. Um, he had been in South Africa as the Boer War correspondent for the Manchester Guardian and had written a letter to his editor um, in which he described the Jewish population, mostly um, German Jews who've moved to South Africa as the veriest scum of Europe. And he also becomes, um, in a lot of his writing around this time, he, he becomes somewhat obsessed with the idea that Jewish people in South Africa are adopting Anglophone names. And he sees this as proof that they want to conceal the extent of their power. So Hobson builds his critique of capitalist imperialism on the idea that there is a network, a diasporic network of Jewish financiers who are manipulating national governments into imperial wars. And it's probably worth kind of thinking about why he's doing this beyond the fact that he's anti-Semitic. And part of this critique is a very calculated attempt to try to split the idea of imperialism from the idea of patriotism. Anti-Boer War activism had been demonised during, you know, the Boer War is a period of, of um, sort of rabid patriotism in Britain, um, particularly, you know, the idea of jingoism is, is particularly uh, kind of embraced in this period, this very kind of, um, this real whipping up of nationalist fervour and, and all, all kinds of kind of popular culture and things to support the war in, in, in South Africa. And anti boer war activism had been really demonised, um, meetings had been attacked, companies owned by anti boer activists that had been attacked, so for example the, the Roundtree coffee houses had been attacked, had been um, had their windows smashed and things, um, and it had been really associated with the left. Ramsay MacDonald, for example, had really spoken out um, quite vocally against the Boer War and, and this kind of anti boer war activism had been used to sort of smear the left in Britain. And so Hobson is sort of deliberately casting imperialism as a Jewish conspiracy because he wants to separate the idea that imperialism is patriotic and he wants to argue that left wing imperialism is in fact um, left wing anti imperialism sorry is kind of inherently patriotic because it's sort of seeing empire as something which Britain should not want to be involved with and is kind of creating instead a national identity around a working class which can kind of separate itself off from from this conspiracy as he sees it the othering of Jewish people as an imagined community of shady elites, obviously a very common anti-Semitic trope, therefore has a particular role on the, in, on the left in this period, and they're trying to claim political legitimacy at home. And, and that's just one example, and it's a reason, it's, you know, it's a pretty famous example, but I think it's an important one in problematizing the relationship between the left, race, empire, and anti-Semitism. And it helps to explain a particular way that anti-Semitism has often been present on the British left especially for people who are unwilling or unable to conceptually separate ideas about capitalism and imperialism from these anti-Semitic tropes. And it also, I, I would say, it goes hand in hand with a kind of conspiracist thinking 
and conspiracist thinking and the belief in conspiracy theories is often driven by a sense of alienation from mainstream politics and the sense that the establishment does not speak for or represent the communities in which these conspiracies take hold. Um, and it, perhaps it's politically easier to blame this on perceived outside forces than to accept the idea that your country does not care for you. Um, it's easier in some way politically to kind of blame, to, to lean into conspiratorial thinking rather than to think more about the structures that mean that actually your community is being ignored or ostracized. And, you know, this isn't to say, obviously, that everyone on the left has historically been anti-Semitic or that the political left has historically been more anti-Semitic than the political right. And when taken to the extremes of British politics, this very clearly isn't the case. There has been a persistent uh, minority, but sustained very persistent far right politics in Britain. And, we, you know, you can draw a really clear line, I think, from Mosley's British Union of Fascists to John's National Labour Party, Colin Jordan's White Defence League, A.K. Chesterton's National Front, Nick Griffin's British National Party, Nigel Farage's UKIP. Um, and far right politics in this country has always at least been partly framed around anti-Semitism and increasingly also anti-black racism and anti-black racism and anti-migrant feeling in particular. And I'm not saying that to try to weigh up the left against the right, but to point out that a very violent anti-Semitism has been bound up with racism in this country for a long time and has been associated with a particular part of the British, politic uh, British political spectrum. And that that's important in terms of myth making and British political culture, because the left draws on their history of opposing that sort of violent fascism and racism in order to make claims about their contemporary political identity. Um, and this is why I laughed out loud when I saw Tony Kushner's talk title for tomorrow, why some of Jeremy Corbyn's best parents were at Cable Street, because it is such a trope in left wing politics to talk about Cable Street as this particular moment when the left opposes fascism and therefore opposes anti-Semitism. And of course, you know, that period in autumn 1936, when this quite loose coalition of left wing and anti-fascist groups fights with barricades and street battles against Mosley's British Union of Fascists in Cable Street in the East End, in Bermondsey and around the country. You know, of course, this is an important part of the left's politics. In Southampton, where Parks is based, Mosley had spoken in 1934 to, to very little kind of reception, really, or opposition, but in 1937 attracted a large crowd of committed anti-fascists who booed throughout his speech through rocks, one of which hit him in the face and necessitated him fleeing the scene in a tram. But it's worth noting here, given the Labour Party's commitment to Cable Street as part of its history, the, firstly, much of this opposition is truly a grassroots movement. So a lot of this comes from small local groups within communities defending themselves. But secondly, because the Labour Party had consistently resisted the call to participate in an anti-fascist united front, and had refused this throughout the 1930s because of their um, their resistance to working with the Communist Party. Cable Street is not a Labour Party. It, it's not something the Labour Party can claim, really, historically. It's groups uh, like trade unions, the independent Labour Party, the, um, the Communist Party of Great Britain, and also other groups like the Socialist Youth um, Movement, the Jewish Movement, the Habanim that are much more active in this, although, of course, many Labour Party supporters and members are involved in, in this kind of broader campaign. For the left in Britain, Cable Street has become a kind of touchstone of politics. It's become a moment alongside the Spanish Civil War that proves a long long-standing commitment of the Labour Party to particular values. And so Cable, Cable Street has become a way of kind of arguing against the existence of a Labour anti-Semitism because Labour uses its history to create the notion of a Labour movement that is both historically rooted, but apparently also timeless. And Cable Street exists the moment that sort of transcends history on free politics, and it can be used to disavow any and all criticisms of anti-Semitism on the left. You can just call back to the fact that Labour is associated with Cable Street. Um, and I'm, I'm going, going to stop there, but I, I wanted really just to use this talk to point out that the way in which the British left has historically dealt with both anti-semit like had has engaged in anti-semitic thinking but also in, also kind of dealt with anti-semitism are both really important for the left's identity and sense of itself today and part of the reason why these questions are so complex is because the the ways in which these his histories are constructed and understood are not really historical but they're about the building of myths and identities
Um, and so it makes it very difficult to have historically grounded conversations about this because people's relationship to this isn't really historic. It's much more about politics, if that makes sense. So thank you. Hello, everyone. Hi, uh, so yeah, thanks for that. Uh, thanks to both speakers for those talks. Uh, very interesting stuff. Um, lots of questions. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be monitoring the chat feed. If you've got any questions, please continue to write them for all of us to see in the chat. Um, I can see there's been a few directed at Claire already. So maybe I'll just start with a couple of these, uh, give Claire some time uh, to talk about them. And then maybe in the meantime, maybe if people want to write some questions for Charlotte, you're very welcome to do so in the uh, in the chat function. So a couple for Claire then. Um, the first one's from Ivor Gadver. Sorry if I haven't pronounced that correctly, by the way. Um, this question is a big one. Given the Soviet policy of wanting to encourage assimilation, why did the Soviet Union set up their own version of Jewish homeland in Borobudzhan? And maybe take another one. And this one's from Maureen Boyle. Thank you for this, Maureen. Um, did you say that the socialists initially provided protection for Yiddish? Yeah. Thank you for this question, and I will answer both um, together because basically they are connected. So yes, there is a, a, an apparent contradiction between the fact that the uh, Bolsheviks and, uh, aimed for the complete assimilation of Jews and the fact that they still protected Jewish national rights. And for them, it was a temporary, pragmatic solution the Jewish question, and um, in a way, an adjustment to the reality. They could they, they could not ignore the fact that uh, Jews had a very strong national and nationalist movement, uh, and not only Jews but many other national groups in the Soviet Union. And so they adapted, they adopted this policy of um, this national. Uh, policy in 1922-23, where they basically provided national rights to specific groups in a specific territory, and they allowed these groups to be uh, national in form, to, to create cultures that were national in forms, but Soviet in content. So, and that's why also they protected the Yiddish language, because to them the Yiddish language was in a way the only uh, authorized vehicle or, for uh, Jewishness. They, they, of course, forbade uh, religion, communal structures, etc. So Yiddish was the way where in which Jews could express themselves. The hope was that once uh, all these people would become Sovietized, and once the uh, equality would reign, and once the, the the socialism would have been built, all the ethnic differences and national differences would have would disappear naturally, and that in the end, after a few decades, there would be no question of national, and that basically uh, that all the questions would would focus on. Uh, an opposition between the exploiters and the exploitees. I mean, of course, it was com they were totally wrong, and uh, we know what what it what it resulted in. Um, but that's that's the yeah. Can Did you add something, Ivo? We can't hear you. You need to unmute your mic. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Just I didn't quite understand if they eventually wanted to have total assimilation and yet um, created a Jewish homeland. I don't see how it would work. They were suppose, supposedly the Jewish homeland was meant to be where Jews would go and live. So how could that? It just doesn't make sense. I know it, it is very contradictory, but in a way, so they had a they had a problem with Jews because Jews did not fit uh, Stalin's definition of a nation. According to Stalin, a nation should have uh, a common culture should have uh, peasants so economic grounds and, and should have a territory. Jews didn't have a territory. So in a way to turn Jews into a full-fledged nation, they provided them with a territory, which was the Bureau of Ejan. You are absolutely right. It was also, uh, th there were lots of reasons to create Bureau of Ejan. Also, to, in, in competition with the Zionist 
um, movement to offer a, a red Zion, and also because they needed to strengthen their borders uh, in this. So, yes, there is a contradiction, and and we know where it led because it led to the complete collapse of the of the Soviet Union because of this growing nationalism in the Soviet Union. So clearly, their national policy was in a way very productive. Uh, yeah. Other questions? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, got a few more questions for Claire that have popped on my uh, noting pad, but I've got a question for Charlotte from Benjamin Bland. Hello, Benjamin. Um, so, this question is he, first of all, Benjamin says he lost the audio a bit, so apologies if he missed something on this near the end, if it's been covered. Do you think the Labour Party's anti-fascism is about patriotism, i.e. about discrediting sham patriotism of fascists, more than it is about anti-racism, let alone opposing anti-Semitism? That's that question. I think, I think that's a really interesting question. And in the chat, um, Ben draws attention to the kind of Gilroy and uh, I think Tony's um, kind of critique of the anti-Nazi league. Um, and I think that does go back to what I was saying about this idea about British values and construct, you know, and the British British values basically come out of, um, they come out of Gordon Brown, essentially. They may have been imposed in schools in 2014 as mandatory, but it actually comes out of kind of a new Labour thing. Um, this idea of claiming, which the left and the right both try to do in different ways, claiming these values as particularly particularly inherently British and the argument becomes not about whether these values are things that actually are British but about which side of the political spectrum best is best you know able to support them so they, there is no discussion really about whether tolerance or you know tolerance and of diversity of religion is actually a British value instead the debate becomes well are the, is the left or the right best place to defend this value that we all have to agree is is inherently about being British um, and I think a lot of the anti-fascist discourse in Britain, I mean, at the time in the 1930s, but actually particularly after the Second World War, obviously, it becomes a way of talking about, um, it becomes a way of talking about Britain's participation in the Second World War, or perhaps the other way around, the Second World War becomes a way of talking about Britain as inherently anti-fascist. And, and the left does this a lot, right? Like Orwell does this a lot. Um, in that he constructs the idea of Britain as being inherently anti-fascist again because of some sort of British value um, and therefore yeah exactly kind of says that um, people on the right or people on the extreme right or fascists are, are inherently not English they're not British you can construct a, a sort of national identity which excludes them and I think you're right and I think that it it, it makes a lot of sense therefore that the actual values at the heart of anti-fascism get somewhat lost and it becomes much more about a, a, a sort of uh, um, a construction and a performance of national identity, which becomes about trying to claim space in terms of political sort of legit political legitimacy, essentially, which goes back to the stuff in the late 19th century and the early 20th century with Hobson, where he's trying to claim patriotism for the left by claiming that imperialism is itself kind of inherently anti-patriotic because it because of this kind of Jewish conspiracy theory. So I think, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, can you hear me? Thanks for, thanks for that. Um, so maybe I'll pose one more for Charlotte um, and then we can maybe take a couple more for Claire because Claire had more and I can see you've got another one, Charlotte. So questions are coming thick and fast. Um, so yeah, this is a question from Jen Lewis Midler. Thanks for this, really interesting. So Charlotte, I really liked your discussion. It was easier for the British population to side with anti-Semitic values rather than accept their government or in fact political party maybe had let them down. But could you elaborate on this a little more? Yeah, I, I've got really into, I was about to say I've got really into conspiracy theories. I obviously, I don't, I, I, I've become very interested in why people believe conspiracy theories and I've actually come to this through kind of Brexit. Um, and thinking about how people start to believe conspiracy theories around around Brexit and kind of Trump and things. But I think there's a lot to be said for the idea that conspiracy theories are very easy to mock if you are somebody who can fundamentally believe that the political establishment 
is on your side and has your best interests at heart. And I think conspiracy theories become a lot easier to take or to at least not to take seriously, but to understand why they occur. If you if you start from the position that actually your government does not care about you and your the state in which you live does not have your interests at heart and, and does not, in fact, you know, care about you essentially in any way. Um, but at the same time, that I think that for people. For, for people kind of who are engaging with conspiracy theories, that that is a difficult thing to come to terms with. And and because of the role of um, because of the role of the press and because of various other things, I think it's it's easier for people to. You know, this is this is a kind of an, an obvious point, but, you know, it's easier. It's easier for people to, to sort of highlight a scapegoated community or for to sort of look outwards for people to blame for their position than it is to accept that actually there are structural reasons why people experience oppression within their countries and that until those structural reasons are changed they're not going to that it, things aren't going to get better so i think kind of anti anti-semitic conspiracy theories for example anti-semitic conspiracy theories framed around working class people in britain thinking that they're being exploited because of a jewish conspiracy it is potentially easier for people to believe that than to think well actually the british government does not essentially really care about working class people it's easier to blame outside forces than it is to feel about your to feel that your identity is so casually unimportant to the people who are running your country i think okay yeah uh, thanks for that so yeah very very interesting discussion i can see both speak the questions are really piling up on both sides now um so maybe I'll pose a couple more for Claire before heading back to Charlotte. Um, I think we've got a bit of time. So there's a question here earlier from Anushka. And the question for Claire is, can you explain the origins of the anti cosmopolitanism campaign of the late 1990s, early 1950s? And there's another question. This one's from Mark Cornwall. Can we say Stalin deliberately and subtly exploited anti-Semitism when necessary to remove key opponents, such as, for example, Trotsky? Or is it impossible to divorce these moves from his crusade against so-called class enemies? I can see Claire's got a couple more questions, but maybe I'll give a bit of time to respond to those. Maybe there's a few more yeah. for Charlotte, and then maybe maybe then we'll go back to them. So both speakers have time to articulate some yeah. interesting questions going on. Thank you, George. Um, so the question of about the anti-cosmopolitan um, campaign. So as I said, it's a uh, it's quite a shift from pre-war uh, policies, and it's. N I, I want to really emphasize that Jews were not targeted as a national group during the Great Terror. So something changed after the Second World War, and uh, it's basically connected to the Jewish political and cultural revival that followed the Second World War. So the 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 work on the Black Book of Russian Jews. So th there were two authors, Hamburg and Grossman, who started to compile documents about the Shoah, the Holocaust on the Soviet territory. Um, and the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee was uh, very influential after the, the, the Second World War, very um, popular. And also the, 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 the visit Golda Meir, so the first Israeli ambassador to the United States in 1948, was um, was also a, a, a key point and, and a turning point. And uh, Stalin probably didn't like these, you know, these new claims, these new national demands emerging from from the Jewish population. So the, the anti-cosmopolitan campaign was really well officially against. West influence and contests with foreigners, but in reality, it was against uh, the Jewish culture and it targeted Jewish intellectuals, Jewish writers. Uh, it started with Michoels, who was the chair of this uh, anti-Jewish fascist committee. So some some people, and it links to the question of Mark Cornwall, would say that at this stage, Stalin was probably also becoming more ill including uh, mentally and probably also a bit more uh, anti-Semitic, but in, in, a, yeah, in a mentally uh, sick way. Uh, and I don't think that 
his attacks against Trotsky were connected to Trotsky's Jewishness, and it's not, I know it's not the sense of your question. Um, I don't think either that he used um, enormously Trotsky's Jewishness in his attacks against him, but it was used, but he probably knew it, it would actually be used locally, uh, and that it would touch uh, this very strong, deep, long-standing Judeophobic feelings in, in the Russian uh, population. But it, 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 I mean, the, the question of Stalin's anti-Semitism is very uh, controversial, difficult. I'm not an expert in that, but I think that at this point, Stalin worked with Jews and with non-Jews, uh, did not express um, strong anti-Semitic feelings, or I mean, uh, some of his most well, closest advisors or associates were Jewish, like Kaganovich. Uh, so I, I, I don't have a, a very clear answer to your question, Mark. Well, Great, thank you, says Mark in the chat. Um, <laughs> so I've got a couple more questions for Charlotte now. So this one's from Max Monday, and it says, were there significant examples of political clashes within the left and the Labour Party about anti-Semitism, conspiracy mm -hmm. theorism, and so on? For example, against narratives like those of Robert Blatchford of the Clarion. And another question is from Katie Turner. And this is to second that of Jen Lewis Fiddler and add, how much can we consider that itself a British value considering the long history of that particular anti semitic scapegoating in England, dating all the way back to the 13th century? Um, so so how far is anti-Semitism itself a, a, a core British value, essentially, because of the, the length of time it's been in Britain or? Um, I, I mean, think so, but please do write in the chat if you're still out there listening to us. Because yeah, I think I think there's a word or two missing from that question. The way I mean, I, I would say that I the way that Britain has constructed, you know, all, all countries construct narratives about themselves, right? All, all countries construct national myths based on their history. Um, Britain's position in the Second World War has enabled it to construct a narrative itself of itself as a kind of humanitarian and tolerant nation because it constructs its narrative of itself against nazism right and and what happens in british political discourse is that you have you end up with these two kind of things where you have nazism and like nazi fascism and you have british democracy and through that construction britain sort of avoids having to have any discussions about racism in britain about anti-semitism in britain about lack of tolerance about a lack of tolerance of refugees about a lack of humanitarian feeling because it can always point to its role fighting against the Germans in the Second World War, right? In the same way that that Labour harks back to Cable Street to say Labour cannot possibly have an, a problem with anti-Semitism because you know we had this role against Cable Street. So it becomes a really in, a really easy shorthand. Um, I think I would agree with what um, I think I'd agree with what I think Tony has said before that I think kind of communities and grassroots communities are often much more tolerant than governments in Britain. Um, and I get very frustrated when people write about kind of white working class communities as being inherently um, like prejudiced or anti-tolerant because actually the working classes in Britain have always been diverse and cosmopolitan and there's always been a kind of um, practical anti-racism among working class communities. People like Satham Verdi have written about this quite a lot, right? A lot of actually, um, anti-fascist activism in Britain is rooted in working class communities and kind of comes out of that. So I think that the values depend on where you're looking in society as well. Um, and the other question, I can't remember what it was. So to, oh yeah, different political clashes within the left yeah. on the issue of anti-Semitism. So yeah, so Robert yeah. Blatchford of the Clarion is, is another one. Uh, Blatchford repeats these kind of Hobson-esque Hobson critiques of the Boer War. Um, he refers in the Clarion to Johannesburg, for example, when he's writing about South Africa. Um, 
and there is the Social Democratic Federation, for example, really pushes against this. There is there is a push against it. There is, of course, um, you know, a, a very lively Jewish left wing politics in Britain in this period who are also obviously were pushing against this. Um, and although the TUC and the Independent Labour Party are quite critical, for example, when Blatchford is writing, they're quite critical of Jewish immigration because they see it as undercutting working class um, British people and they see it as a way for elites to avoid paying proper wages and things like this. There are, are also plenty of trade union groups um, who are much more kind of, or, or kind of grassroots organisations who are much more supportive of um, Jewish migration and much more kind of resistant to to attempts to scapegoat. So I think there's I, I'm not sure that there are really significant political clashes in the sense that this becomes big arguments at that point. It, it becomes an issue much more much more around the issue of um, Zionism and the position of Israel with the Labour Party that that's where it becomes a clash much more into like after 1969 basically it becomes much more of an issue. Okay thanks for that uh, thanks for those thanks for answering the question Charlotte and also thanks to Katie as well for the clarification in the comments. Um, yes so there's a couple more actually for Claire um, so there's two more and this one's from Maureen Boyle um, and Maureen is asking Claire, uh, wondering about the idea of the denouncing of the Jews as class enemies in relation to the shuttle, which associate with poverty, and wondered, was there a distinction made between shuttle Jews and the wealthier city Jews, who ironically would often have been more assimilated? And there was also another question from Francine Dollins, and Francine's question is, what connection was there between the national left-wing anti-Semitism in Britain and Russia and the Soviet Union in the 19th and the 20th centuries? Or were these parallel movements that were not interconnected in some way? Thank you. Um, so to the first question, it's a very good question. And, and you are absolutely right that um, the Jewish population that migrated to the big cities after the revolution, because suddenly they were allowed to leave the Pale of Settlement and to live in uh, the interior of Russia, these Jews assimilated um, quickly and did not pose really a problem to the Soviet authorities. The problem was these Jews who still lived in the shtetls, so in the small towns in Belarus and Ukraine, and who, who were typically uh, small merchants, uh, artisans, uh, and who considered themselves actually true proletarians, but not in a way that was satisfactory for the Bolsheviks. So clearly this, this policy, these social economic policies targeted this population and, and the Soviet authorities tried throughout the 20s and the 30s to solve this shtetl question and this social economic question through in the industrialization, then through forced collectivization and before that in the 20s through the economic policy. So you are right that these these, these uh, economic policies targeted much more the 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 Jews of the of the peripheries in a way and, and of the shtetls. And the question of uh, Francine um, I, d I don't think there is direct connection between uh, left-wing anti-Semitism in Britain uh, and Russia because I guess that as you will have seen from uh, our two presentations, in a way it's, it's very different, the, the, the nature and the origins of this uh, left-wing anti-Semitism. And I guess that the situation of the Jews in Britain and in Eastern Europe in general was quite different. The fact that in Eastern Europe, Jews were identified not only or not mostly as a religious group, but were identified as a nation. Um, and as a cultural group, not only as a community, um, created this additional layer of, of uh, traditions and of uh, uh, anti-Semitism that is probably not very comparable with the British situation, but I'm not a specialist, Charlotte. The um, only thing I would say about a comparison would be that obviously there's a big you know, British left, the British left is looking to the Soviet Union 
throughout the you know 1940s 1950s and and there are different points at which the British left kind of disavows the Soviet Union and you know maybe some of them in 1956 with Hungary maybe some of them in 1968 right but there, there are people who still feel themselves very affiliated with with what's happening in Russia and, and very really kind of believe in it and and I can well believe and cannot off the top can't off the top of my head remember but I'm very sure that there are examples of British left-wing people who who through through their own anti-semitism in Britain also see you know also also object also have a kind of wider anti-semitic um anger about Jewish people undermining the USSR as well as what's happening in Britain if that makes sense because because the British left a part of the British left is so connected to what's happening in Russia and sees Russia so much as a kind of example of how socialist government might happen so I can I can well believe there would be some sort of connection there but I can't think of anyone in particular okay yeah th thanks for those answers and um, thanks to both of our speakers for their uh, great presentations so thanks for answering the questions in so much detail I've had a careful look through all of these uh, comments and I think we've I think we've had a chance at having a bash at all of the substantive questions. So thanks to all of our audience as well for uh, chipping in and offering some really interesting and insightful reflections as well. And also getting some positive comments as well. So yeah, thanks to uh, both of our speakers from the audience as well. People are commenting how much on they really enjoyed the sessions for our both very fascinating talks. Thank you very much.